namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa so this time i'm going to begin a series going through the mahaparinibbana sutta i think it'll take maybe five talks to get through it at a reasonable pace. The Mahaparinibbana Sutta number 16 in the Digha Nikaya is a very beautiful text. It has a large narrative component. It's the story of the Buddha's last days. So it's uh, quite a moving story and it's a very beloved sutta in Buddhist countries and there are slightly different versions in Chinese and Tibetan and there's a Sarastavadan version still surviving. It's likely that the the Pali version that we have is the oldest. It's also very likely that as we'll go through we'll see some digressions where there's a, something that seems to be off the main stream of the, the narrative. That these sections very likely have been added in at some point between the First Council and the, um, the time of Buddhaghosa. But certainly the, the core of this goes back to of the original, the original uh, sutta as pronounced by Ananda at the First Council. So I'll read it and I'll stop now and again to uh, comment. It begins like most of the suttas, Thus have I heard a Wang Mei Sutang, which is what Ananda said at the First Council. He had his phenomenal memory. He had remembered everything the Buddha had said, and he rehearsed, as they say, the, um, the suttas at the First Council. And he began each one, thus have I heard, this is what I have heard, they will me sutan. This is uh, the last few months of the Buddha's life. Once the Lord was staying at Rajagaha, on the mountain called Vulture's Peak. Now just then King Ajatasattu Vedihiputta of Magadha wanted to attack the Vajians. He said, I will strike the Vajians who, who are so powerful and strong. I will cut them off and destroy them. I will bring them to ruin and destruction. Magadha was this, the um, biggest kingdom in Northern India at the time. And after the Buddhist time, it became the kernel of the um, the empire, the Mauryan Empire that uh, Ahsoka was a, a ruler of. And the, the Vajians were a, a powerful republic bordering with Magadha. The Indian states at the time were divided into kingdoms and republics. The republics were the older form of government, and at this time they were gradually being conquered and replaced by centralizing monarchies. And when we say republic, we should always be careful in these, not to impose onto these old texts, modern ideas, that the republics aren't what we understand as a republic today. They were more like oligarchies uh, ruled by heads of clans. It was an old tribal organization. Ajatasattu is the king who killed his father, Bimbisara, so he was, he's not really a nice person. Then King Ajatasattu said to his chief minister, the Brahman Vasakara, Brahman, go to the blessed Lord, worship him with your head to his feet, and in my name ask if he is free from sickness or disease, if he is living at ease, vigorously and comfortably, and then say, Lord, King Ajatasattu Vedihaputta of Magadha 
wishes to attack the Vajians and says, I will strike the Vajians, bring them to ruin and destruction. And whatever the Lord declares to you, report that faithfully back to me, for Tathagatas never lie. Wasakara was the uh, Purohita, that's the, the chief minister who was usually a Brahmin. The kingdoms had a kind of a diarchy that the king would be a Katya caste, warrior caste, and his chief minister would always be a Brahmin. So the two uh, high castes would be represented. Uh, Wasakara was a tricky, crafty kind of a fellow. and uh, there's, there's one curious story about him that... that um, Later on, in, uh, he uh, one time saw Mahakachana, the Arahant, one of the great dis the chief disciples, coming down the the mountain, and he remarked to somebody, "That monk looks just like a monkey." And this got back to the Buddha, and the Buddha said, "For saying that, he will be reborn as a monkey in the such and such a forest." And when uh, Vasakara heard that uh, he started planting fruit trees in that forest so when he lived there as a monkey he would have a, a happier existence <laughs> anyway at this, at this time he's there seeing, he's sent to the Buddha on the orders of the king very good sire said Vasakara and having had the state carriage harnessed he mounted one of them and drove in state from Rajagaha to Vulture's Peak riding as far as the ground would allow. Then, continuing on foot to where the Lord was, he exchanged courtesies with the Lord and sat down to one side and delivered the king's message. Now the venerable Ananda was standing behind the Lord, fanning him, and the Lord said, Ananda, have you heard that the Vajians hold regular and frequent assemblies? I have heard, Lord, that they do. So the Buddha is not answering Thasakara directly, but he's sending a message via Ananda. You know, he's speaking to Ananda, and Thasakara is listening. Ananda, as long as the Vajians hold regular and frequent assemblies, they may be expected to prosper and not decline. Have you heard that the Vajians meet in harmony, break up in harmony, carry on their business in harmony? I have heard that they do, Lord. Ananda, as long as the Vajans meet in harmony, break up in harmony, carry on their business in harmony, they may be expected to prosper and not decline. Have you heard that the Vajans do not authorize what has not been authorized already, and do not abolish what has been authorized, but proceed according to what has been authorized by their ancient tradition? I have, Lord. Have you heard that they honor, respect, revere, and salute the elders among them, and consider them worth listening to, that they do not forcibly abduct others' wives and daughters and compel them to live with them, that they honor, respect, revere, and salute the Vajian shrines at home and abroad, not withdrawing the proper support given before, that proper provision is made for the safety of Arahants, so that such arahants may come in future to live there, and those already there may live in comfort. I have, Lord. Ananda, so long as such proper provision is made, the vajans may be expected to prosper and not decline. So this is one of the passages that sometimes uh, cited and discussed, is the, the Buddha giving a kind of political advice. And again, I you know caution not to try and retroactively interpret things through a modern perspective. But this is the um, advice the Buddha gave: how a republic can prosper and not thrive. That they should meet in harmony, meet frequently. Um, they should uphold their ancient traditions and not not change things around respect the elders, treat the women properly, and um, uh, so forth. So this, this particular passage 
has a kind of a conservative bent to it. There, there's a, another sutta where the Buddha is talking, the Kutadanta Sutta, where the Buddha is talking about a good king and advising the king to, uh, in this, it's a story about a Buddha's previous rebirth, and he's the Piruhita, he's the advisor, the minister of the king, and he's advising the king to intervene in the economy effectively, to give, give land to those who want to farm, give wages to those who want to work, and uh, loan capital to those who want to uh, set up business. So in that, that sutta sounds in modern terms more like a socialist or a social democrat. So you can cherry pick passages to you know, make the Buddha whatever you want in some, some regard. But this is his advice of you know, how the Vajian Republic could stand Ananda, so long as such proper provision is made, the Vajans may be expected to prosper and not decline. Then the Lord said to the Brahman Vasakara, Once, one, Brahman, when I was at the Sarandada shrine in Vesali, I taught the Vajans these seven principles, preventing decline. And as, as long as they keep to these seven principles, as long as these principles remain in force, the Vajans may be expected to prosper and not decline. At this, Vasakara replied, Reverend Gotama, if the Vajans keep to even one of these principles, they may be expected to prosper and not decline, far less all seven. Certainly the Vajans will never be conquered by King Ajatasattu by force of arms, but only by means of propaganda and setting them one against another. And now, Reverend Gotama, may I depart. I am busy and have much to do. Brahman, do as you think fit. And Vesakara, rejoicing and delighted at the word, Lord's words, rose from her seat and departed. This sutta doesn't go on into to what happened next, but in the um, uh, Vinaya text, the, the story is continued that uh, Vesakara worked up a scheme with the king and he pretended that he was. Uh, the king pretended to be angry with him and exiled him from the country for being too friendly to the Vajans. said that he had spoke up in favor of the Vajans at the assembly. So he then went to the Vajan, Vasakara went to the Vajan kingdom and in, or republic and inserted himself in there and got the position or post of uh, we would say minister of education. He was in charge of teaching the young and he corrupted them. He taught them to turn against each other not and not respect their elders and so on and so on. And the, uh, the, the Republic broke up in disharmony and they were easily conquered by Ajatasattu in, in a few years. Uh, soon after v Vasakara had gone, the Lord said to Ananda, Go to whatever monks there are round about Rajagaha and summon them to the assembly hall. Very good, Lord, said Ananda, and he did so. Then he came to the Lord, saluted him, stood to one side and said, Lord, the order of monks is assembled. Now is the time for the Lord to do as he sees fit. Then the Lord rose from his seat and went to the assembly hall, sat down on the prepared seat and said, Monks, I will teach you seven things conducive to welfare. Listen, pay attention, and I will speak. Yes, Lord, said the monks. And the Lord said, now he takes the same seven principles and modifies them so they apply to the Sangha. As long as the monks hold regular and frequent assemblies, they may be expected to prosper and not decline. As long as they meet in harmony, break up in harmony, and carry on their business in harmony, they may be expected to prosper and not decline. As long as they do not authorize what has not been authorized already and do not abolish what has been authorized, but proceed according to what has been authorized by the rules of training. As long as they honor, respect, revere, and salute the elders of long standing who are long ordained, fathers and leaders of the order, as long as they do not fall prey to desires which arise in them and lead to rebirth, 
as long as they are devoted to forest lodgings, as long as they preserve their personal mindfulness, so that in future the good among their companions will come to them, and those who have already come will feel at ease with them, as long as the monks hold to these seven things and are seen to have done so, they may be expected to prosper and not decline. So we have, for example, uh, the monks to hold to the rules of training and not to authorize that which has not been previously laid down. It's the principle of the, the, the Vinaya is that the rules for the monks were set by the Buddha and no one subsequently has the authority to change them. Uh, so sometimes, we, you never not from the, the bhikkhus, but sometimes you hear lay Buddhists suggesting, well, it's modern times, why don't you change this or that rule? But it's not, it's not possible. The, the rules cannot be changed. They were laid down by the Buddha and they're not, uh, not subject to any amendment until the next Buddha comes. Then he does a few, uh, uh, a few more variations on this. I will tell you another seven things conducive to welfare. As long as monks do not rejoice and delight and become absorbed in works, in chattering, in sleeping, in company, in evil desires, in mixing and associating with evil friends, as long as they do not rest content with partial achievements, as long as the monks hold on to these seven things and are seen to do so, they may be expected to prosper and not decline. I will tell you another seven things conducive to welfare. As long as the monks continue with faith, with modesty, with fear of doing wrong, with learning, with aroused vigor and established mindfulness, with wisdom. I will tell you another seven things. As long as the monks develop the enlightenment factors of mindfulness, of investigation of phenomena, of energy, of delight, of tranquility, of concentration, of equanimity the seven bojanga, the seven factors of enlightenment. I will tell you another seven things. As long as monks develop the perception of impermanence, of not-self, of impurity, of danger, of overcoming of dispassion, and of cessation, they may be expected to prosper and not decline. Monks, I will tell you six things that are conducive to communal living. As long as the monks, both in public and in private, show loving kindness to their fellows in acts of body, speech, and thought, share with their virtuous follow fellows whatever they receive as a rightful gift, including the contents of their alms bowl, which they do not keep to themselves. If they keep consistently unbroken and unaltered those rules of conduct that are spotless, leading to liberation, praised by the wise, unstained and conducive to concentration and persist therein with their fellows both in public and in private continue into that noble view that leads to liberation to the utter destruction of suffering remaining in such awareness with their fellows both in public and in private as long as the monks hold to these six things and are seen to do so they may be expected to prosper and not decline and then the Lord, while staying at Vulture's Peak, gave a comprehensive discourse. This is morality. This is concentration. This is wisdom. Concentration, when imbued with morality, brings great fruit and profit. Wisdom, when imbued with concentration, brings great fruit and profit. The mind imbued with wisdom becomes completely free from corruption. That is, from the corruption of sensuality, of becoming, of false views, and of ignorance. That is the, uh, the corruptions, or translation for the asawas. Comprehensive discourse means that he's covering in one talk the, the whole path from uh, including the, the three components of sila samadhi panya, as ethics, concentration, and wisdom. So this is not a verbatim record of what he said. It would have been a very long talk that he gave to the monks to cover this whole topic. 
And when the Lord had stayed at Rajagaha as long as he wished, he said to the Venerable Ananda, Come, Ananda, let us go to Ambalatika. Very good, Lord, said Ananda. And the Lord went there with a large company of monks. And the Lord stayed in the royal park of Ambalatika, and there he delivered a comprehensive discourse. This is morality, this is concentration, this is wisdom. And having stayed at Ambalatika as long as he wished, the Lord said to Ananda, Let us go to Nalanda. And they did so. At Nalanda, the Lord stayed in Pawarika's mango grove. Many centuries later, Nalanda became the site of the largest Buddhist center of, of learning, the University of Nalanda. Then the Venerable Sariputta came to see the Lord and saluted him, sat down to one side and said, It is clear to me, Lord, that there never has been, will be, or is now another ascetic or Brahman who is better or more enlightened than the Lord. You have spoken boldly with a bull's voice, Sariputta. You have roared the lion's roar of certainty. How is that? Have all the Arahant Buddhas of the past appeared to you? And were the minds of all those lords open to you? So as to say, these lords were of such virtue, such was their teaching, such was their wisdom, such was their way, such their liberation. No lord. And have you perceived all the Arahant Buddhas who will appear in the future? No lord. Well then, Sariputta, you know me as the Arahant Buddha, and do you know the Lord is of such virtue, such is his teaching, such is wisdom, such is way, such is liberation? No, Lord. So, Sariputta, you do not have knowledge of the minds of the Buddhas, of past, present, or future. Thus, Sariputta, have you not spoken boldly with a bull's voice and roared the lion's roar of certainty with your declaration? Sariputta, of course, is one of the two chief disciples and the one renowned for wisdom. So he wouldn't be talking idly. Saiputra replies to the Buddha, Lord, the minds of the Arahant Buddhas of past, present, and future are not open to me, but I know the drift of the Dhamma. Lord, it is as if there were a royal frontier city with mighty bastions and a mighty encircling wall in which was a single gate, in which was a gatekeeper, wise, skilled, and clever, who kept out strangers and let in those he knew. And he, constantly patrolling and following along a path, might not see the joints and clefts in the bastion, even such as a cat might creep through. But whatever larger creatures entered or left the city must all go through this very gate. And it seems to me, Lord, that the drift of the Dhamma is the same. All those Arahant Buddhas of the past attained to supreme enlightenment by abandoning the five hindrances, the defilements of mind that weaken the understanding, having firmly established the four foundations of mindfulness in their minds and raised the seven factors of enlightenment as they really are. All the Arahant Buddhas of the future will do likewise. And you, Lord, who are now the Arahant, fully enlightened Buddha, have done the same. So Sariputta knew that uh, he himself was, uh, was, of course, Arahant. And so he had a full comprehension of, of the Dhamma and of uh, Nibbana. And he knew that what the Buddha had attained, perfection of the Buddha's state, you know, was, would be the same for any Buddha, past, present, or future because the Dhamma is the Dhamma. And there's no possibility of, of variation there. The Buddha himself uh, elsewhere said, I didn't invent the Dhamma, I discovered it. Like a um, man who might find an abandoned city in the jungle and chop away the creepers to reveal the buildings. Well, so the Dhamma is eternal, it's akaliko, it's timeless. It's always the same whether a Buddha arises or not. And when a Buddha arises, they will know the same Dhamma as every previous Buddha. Then while staying at Nalanda in Pawarika's mango grove, the Lord gave a comprehensive discourse to the monks. 
This is morality, this is concentration, this is wisdom. And having stayed at Nalanda as long as he wished, the Lord said to Ananda, let us go to Pataligama, and they did so. So he's giving this discourse everywhere he goes. It's like he's giving his final summary teachings. He's not going to return to any of these places. These are his last visit to all these towns. At Pataligama, they heard say, the Lord has arrived here. And the lay followers of Pataligama came to the Lord, saluted him, and sat down to one side, and said, may the Lord consent to stay at our rest house. And the Lord consented by silence. Understanding his consent, they rose from their seats, saluted the Lord, and passed by him to the right, went to the rest house, and strewed the floor, prepared seats, provided a water pot, and filled the oil lamp. Then they went to the Lord, saluted him, stood to one side, and said, All is ready at the rest house. Now, Lord, it's time to do as the Lord wishes. And the Lord dressed, took his robe and bowl, and went with his monks to the rest house, where he washed his feet, went in, and sat down facing east, with his back against the central pillar. And the monks, having washed their feet, went in and sat down with their backs to the west wall, facing east. And with the Lord sitting in front of them, and the lay followers of Patalegama, having washed their feet, went in and sat down with their backs to the east wall, facing west, and with the Lord before them. Then the Lord addressed the lay followers of Patalegama, Householders, there are these five perils to one of bad morality, of failure in morality. What are they? In the first place, he suffers great loss of property through neglect of his affairs. In the second place, he gets a bad reputation for immorality and misconduct. In the third place, whatever assembly he approaches, whether of Katiyas, Brahmins, householders, or ascetics, he does so diffidently and shyly. In the fourth place, he dies confused. In the fifth place, after death, at the breaking up of the body, he arises in an evil state, to a bad fate, in suffering and in hell. These are the five perils to one of bad morality. And householder, there are these five advantages to one of good morality, of success in morality. What are they? In the first place, through careful attention to his affairs, he gains much wealth. In the second place, he gets a good reputation for morality and good conduct. In the third place, whatever assembly he approaches, whether of Kachas, Brahmins, householders, or ascetics. He does so with confidence and assurance. In the fourth place, he dies unconfused. In the fifth place, at the breaking up of the body at death, he arises in a good place, a heavenly world. These are the five advantages to one of good morality and a success in morality. So the talk he gives to the to the, the general public. They, these previous talks were given to assemblies of monks, but this is now to the general populace. He stops. He doesn't give the comprehensive discourse. He stops at Sila. He talks about morality. Then the Lord instructed, inspired, and delighted the lay followers of Pataligama with talk and dhamma until far into the night. Then he dismissed them, saying, Householders, the night is nearly over. Now is time for you to do as you see fit. Very good, Lord they said, and rising and saluting the Lord, they passed them by to the right and departed. And the Lord spent the remainder of the night in the rest house, left empty by their departure. Now at this time, Sunida and Wasakara, the Magadan ministers, this is the same Wasakara we met before, Sunida and Wasakara were building a fortress in Patalagama in defense against the Vajans. And at that time, a multitude of thousands of Dewas were taking up lodging in Pataligama. And in the parts where powerful Dewas settled, they caused the minds of the most powerful royal officials to pick those sites for their dwellings. And where middle and lower ranking Dewas settled, so too they caused the minds of royal officials of corresponding grade to pick their site for their, their dwellings. And the Lord with his divine eye, surpassing that of humans, 
saw the thousands of Dewas taking up re residence in Patligama. And getting up at break of day, he said to the Venerable Ananda, Ananda, who is building a fortress at Pataligama? Lord Sunita and Wasakara, the Magadan ministers, are building a fortress against the Vajans. Ananda, just as if they had taken counsel with the 33 gods, Sunita and Wasakara are building a fortress at Pataligama. I have seen with my divine eye how th thousands of Dewas are taking up lodgings there. Ananda, as far as the Orion realm extends, as far as its trade extends, this will be the chief city, Pataliputta, scattering this, its seeds far and wide. And Pataliputta will face three perils, from fire, from water, and from internal dissension. So this is a prophetic uh, statement of the Buddha. This town, Pataligama, which was previously unimportant, was close to the frontier with the Vajans, was now being built up by the royal authorities and fortified, and royal ministers were taking up residence there. And this was marked by thousands of Dewas, uh, because this town became, in the future time, it became Pataliputta, which was the Soka's capital, and was the capital of, of uh, the Mauryan Empire, and ruling over the whole of, of India. It became a very important city for a long time. Then Sunita and Wasakara called on the Lord, having exchanged courtesy, stood to one side and say, May the Reverend Gautama accept a meal from us tomorrow with his order of monks. And the Lord consented by silence. Understanding his consent, Sunita and Wasakara went home and there had a fine meal of hard and soft food prepared. This phrase comes up in in the Vinaya, it comes up a lot, hard and soft food. It's bojana and kadaniya. Um, soft food was considered staples, which was basically grains, mostly rice, but any grains and meat. And those were, those were the uh, soft foods. The hard foods were fruits, curries, you know, side dishes, secondary things. When it was ready, they reported to the Lord, Reverend Gautama, the meal is ready. And the Lord, having dressed in the morning, took his robe and bowl and went with the order of monks to the residence of Sunita and Wasakara and sat down on the prepared seat. Then Sunita and Wasakara served the Lord and the order of monks with choice, soft and hard foods until they were satisfied. And when the Lord took his hand away from his bowl, they sat down on low stools to one side. And as they sat there, the Lord thanked them with these verses. In whatever realm the wise man makes his home, he should feed the virtuous leaders of the holy life. Whatever dewas there are who report this offering, they will pay him respect and honor for this. They tremble for him as a mother for her son, and he for whom the day was tremble, ever happy is. Then the Lord rose from his seat and took his departure. Sunita and Wasakara follow closely behind the Lord, saying, Whichever gate the ascetic Gotama goes out by today, that shall be called the Gotama Gate, and whichever ford he uses to cross the Ganges, that shall be call, called the Gotama Ford. And so the gate by which the Lord went out came to be called the Gotama Gate. And then the Lord came to the river Ganges. And just then the river was so full that a crow could drink out of it. And some people were looking for a boat, and some were looking for a raft, and some were binding together a raft of reeds to get to the other side. But the Lord, as swiftly as a strong man might stretch out his flexed arm or flex it in again, vanished from this side of the Ganges and reappeared with his order of monks on the other shore. And the Lord saw that those people who were looking for a boat, looking for a raft, and binding together a raft of reeds to get to the other side, and seeing their intentions, he uttered this verse on the spot. When they want to cross the sea, the lake, or the pond, people make a bridge or raft, but the wise have crossed already. So this is a 
miracle done by the Buddha, one of the one of the uh, episodes where he does a supernormal feat, um, and it has a symbolic reference of uh, crossing over is often used as a um, simile or metaphor, whatever you want to call it, of for crossing from samsara to nibbana. It's often called the, the far shore. So he he demonstrated physically this his his act of crossing over. The beings on the still on the on the other shore still struggling with their rafts and things. So that's the um, the first section, the first chapter in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta. We have the uh, uh, the sort of the scene established. The Buddha is making a his last tour through um, the uh, middle country, uh, the Ganges Valley country, and visiting these various places for the last time. And in each place he gives a, a Dhamma talk, he gives a discourse. He's, it's like his, his last teachings. You know, he, he, knows that he knows his life is, is near its end and he's giving these final teachings and we see the um, the world continues to move on. You know, there are political machinations going on uh, between the Magadha and the Vajans. And the uh, city of Patilagama or the town of Patilagama is being built into the city of uh, Pataliputta. This uh, this is marked by thousands of devas assembling that are seen only by the Buddha. So that we'll continue uh, next week with the second chapter. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.